What's up? It's Adam with Big Daddy Unlimited here today with my buddy Don Edwards. We brought by, we brought him back again. Uh, he was here with John. I'm sorry about that. Right, John's a uh, little bit of a snooze fest, but it's all oh, good. Uh, okay, so we were talking about night vision, so it was kind of nerdy, anyways. Yeah. So yeah. Don and I have been buddies for a long time. Uh, Don is a person who I lean on for night vision stuff, but also a person who shares in uh, accurate guns, uh, the fondness of that. Um, Don's a huge local trainer here in Florida, travels around the country as well for that. So uh, I'll let him do a little background on himself intro and then we'll get in and we'll talk about uh, SPRs, DMRs, and just accurate 5.56 guns. So. Right, so uh, yeah, everybody, I'm Don Edwards, if you don't know me. Uh, Green Line Tactical is uh, who I am out there on the uh, internets and uh, um, Training company wise, uh, retired SF guy, ranger, law enforcement trainer, industry dude, and uh, or mm -hmm. a nice guy, I guess. I don't know. Yeah, depends I mean, on who you ask. If but, you're in uh, industry, there's no such yeah. thing as nice people. But uh, yeah, so as far as you know, I have a passion for teaching people how to shoot, how to train, how to fight. I've learned a lot of things over the years that uh, I just love to share mm -hmm. with people because it, I feel like I can make a difference there, and. As we've talked about before, night vision has been one of my forte yeah. when it comes to the tactical world. I've been doing that for a long time, and I even brought, I couldn't even bring a rifle to a DMR discussion without putting some sort of night vision on it, right? That's how much of a nerd I am about night vision. So, yeah, so, and uh, I mean, talk about some of that. With DMRs, I mean, it's all about, you know, force multiplication, right. being able to take a, a system that was predominantly just known as a, a combat gun and mm -hmm. give it, you know, a different role within the space that it operates in. So right, right. Uh, if you guys have questions during this, make sure you type them down. We've got That's Allie cool. hidden somewhere in the back uh, reading everything, so she'll make sure that we get it and we'll answer it. And she'll we, screen the calls for us, right? Yeah, so, yeah, so we're, we're seeing you. We yeah. see you guys. Um, okay, so SPR stands for Special Purpose Rifle. Oh, geez, one of my reps is calling me. Never mind. Hmm. Well, uh, special Purpose he's Rifle in, is... Maybe he'll just ask that question. Probably. And you can answer it on, on air. Nah, I don't <laughs> like them that much. <laughs> no. um, special purpose rifles, and then DMR is designated marshman rifle. Um, right. What do those mean to you? What do they mean in the LE sense of it, as well as the civilian side of it? Um, well, first, you know, I, th I think it makes sense to, to talk about how, how we got here yeah. in the first place. Because, you know, there, there was there's kind of an evolution. And, and, you know, different guys have different ways that they, they viewed that evolution. Um, when I first heard the term SPR, it stood for Special Purpose Receiver, and it was an accurized, match-grade upper receiver that you could pop off your old one off your M4 and slap that on So, um, and have glass, the ability to reach out and use some match-grade ammo to, to close some of that distance that you might not be able to do with an M4 with just an ACOG on it. And then that quickly turned into Special Purpose Rifle. It's just like, hey, why do that? Just, just give them a whole new rifle. Um, but the yeah. very first ones I saw, it was they were added receivers that you could just take along with you, and it was real handy. Yeah, at the time. they were they were field originally as the Mark 12s, right? Well, then it was designated the Mark 12 at some point along there, and I'm not I'm not such a history clone um, geek about the stuff that I understand, you know, the progression. I just remember in the early part of the war in Afghanistan, we were when we were training to get over to to go our first trip, they were talking about, hey, you're going to get these special purpose receivers, SPRs, and I'm like, what is that? And, and it's this, and we're like, oh, that's cool. Um, and then by the time we got there, we were getting and starting to see full rifles instead yeah. of just a, a swapped out receiver. And then eventually, I guess somebody called it a Mark 12, and because Crane had something to do with it, but there were recce rifles being built at the same time. There were, there were a lot of, you know, in the early days, there was a lot of off the shelf stuff being, being built and purchased for some of the special operations units. Well, I mean, I'm sure they were seeing such gaps in capabilities, mm -hmm. and then you'd have guys like NSW Crane and right. and big overall SOCOM going into the commercial market yeah. to see what was in there. Yeah, um, yeah JSOC and, and you know entities that could just go go purchase something, mm -hmm. see if it worked, and order 50 of them, because that's all they well, need. They don't need a lot. And it was cool because it was the first time you saw like suppressors actually being fielded, mm -hmm. uh, especially on the Mark 12s with the Ops Inc. cans. Like, that was super rad to me to see uh, at least people to look at it, see a void, and be like, okay, we'll, we'll right. throw this added capability on the system, 
you know, especially fighting at night or, you mm -hmm. know, for, for me being for on the civilian side, you know, hunting at night, reduction. stuff like that, yeah. you know, signature reduction is a huge thing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they started Definitely. fielding uh, Mark 262, which was the 77 grain ammo. Yeah, and that, that, changed, the, that changed the game on that really well. Mm -hmm. some, some good quality, you know, but military grade, something that could handle being in the elements a little bit more, you know, the annealed and the crimped. Um, mm -hmm blasting caps and all the stuff that goes along with the mil spec ammo. So, um, what do you, th now that we've had a lot of time, obviously GWAT's been over for mm -hmm. a while, um, civilian guns and technology as a whole has gotten so, oh, yeah. so advanced. Um, the systems have just gotten better because of it. Oh, so everything's gotten better because of it. Now, you and I have had this conversation, I think, many times is we've, w the gun's essentially the same thing mm -hmm. as, that it's always been. It's, but we've learned over the years and and the machining processes have gotten better the metallurgy the understanding of how the how the gun works it's kind of like there's there's a lot you know a model t car is essentially the same as a modern car yeah in, in how it works and and, and Still all has that. four wheels but and steering wheel. we've learned so much more about how to manufacture the parts and make the tolerances low you know there so same thing here we know how to make better barrels we know how to make higher quality bolts bolt carriers it's the whole the whole gun itself is capable of so much more. Mm -hmm. And and what we have now is the ability for, say in a squad, you know, it's like a squad designated marksman, can, uh, they, if there's one guy in that squad that has the ability to engage targets with more precision out to, you know, say, 600 meters. Yeah, you're versus, just pushing that threat a right. little farther. So out. he's one guy, he's not a sniper mm -hmm. on the team, but he's someone who has a little bit more training in, in marksmanship. And he- Sorry, uh, I have to stop you. Uh, I don't know about the first one, but Sam Houston is definitely a dirtbag. Yeah. I mean, we, we know that. Yeah. Yeah, we, I mean, the, sorry. Well, Question from, the, from, the, uh, from one of our viewers. Yeah. Sam Houston, dot, 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 dirtbag. We both. Hey, Sam, if you're watching. Chris, if you are, you know, they asked about you too. Uh, okay, so what, so anyway. what are your kind of standards? What, do you, what parts are you throwing? What configurations are you building? So for what you'd consider a, a when DMR I, gun? When I built this, this rifle right here, um, it was, it kind of embodies what, at the time, uh, which was, I think I built this gun maybe two and a half years ago, mm -hmm. um, would, would be pretty much the, the, the best when it comes to DMR. It's got an 18 inch match barrel. It's a, it's a Roscoe pure red barrel. Um, and, uh, really like it. It's built with a, an ADM, basically receivers. This is not a factory built rifle. However, I got most of the parts from ADM. Um, Sorry, so, Sam. Let us focus. We yeah. need your help, buddy. <laughs> um, but uh, it's it's got the ambi controls. Yeah. And you know, at first when he did that, I was like, man, I don't know, because I, I never really had a lot of ambi stuff, and I really had had not the best experiences with the bad levers and stuff like that. That were some of the first attempts. Now, especially laying down the prone, I like having <laughs> the ability to not have to take my hand off of anything to put the bolt forward to lock it to the rear. You don't really have to come off the gun like you do. Um, without it. Yeah, I mean, um, like from us long gunners, like we've never had to remove our support hand from a rear mm -hmm. bag. Like everything came off fire. Yeah, hand. you can do everything. Yeah, you know, you're manipulating a bolt and everything. Mm -hmm. and now you have the ability with ambi sets just to reach your finger up, drop right. the bolt. If you need to, you know, clear a malfunction, it's significantly easier. Significantly. You don't have to break your actual body position to manipulate the gun in a more effective manner. Yeah. So, I mean, obviously the heart and soul of this is, is the barrel, but the rifle itself is very ergonomic and, um, and easy to use. Uh, okay. Answer another question, real quick. Eighteen-inch barrel. So okay. uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, we're gonna stick on this. We'll come back to Scott's Scott, question. Scott, we'll get to you, man. Um, I'm not like eighteen-inch guns. They serve a different realm for me. Mm -hmm. um, I think nowadays, especially with bullets, uh, I have a gen general ability and push towards fourteen and a half inch and sixteen-inch guns. I see yeah. them, especially with suppressors on them, kind of filling the same void, but having you know overall yeah. shorter length I, I i agree with you and like i said at the time i built this that's what i thought mm -hmm. was going to be the best now i would say i have i have very similar um, rifles with 16 inch and they'll do everything this will if i've got a good scope on it you're, you're sacrificing a little bit of bullet speed yeah but not not enough to make it significant um, but once you start getting into like the 20 inch, yeah. you're, you're now you've got a full on rifle. I mean, you've seen and my 22 with a can, yeah, it's a yeah. musket. Um, not that you couldn't do CQB with that, but you would rather not, Yeah. right? This I think is about the biggest 
you know, and, and without all this stuff on it, but, you know, let's say that I'm, you know, a guy on, a, on an SF team, like I once was, mm -hmm. and this is my primary. I've got, I got an aim point right here on an offset, right? I could clear my way w with the team to the roof mm -hmm. with, this, with this rifle almost as easily as I could with a shorty. And it also, it doesn't, you know, you don't stand out in the pack. Like, right. I'm shooting the running, same ammo. Yep. You know, so if I run out of 77 grain, somebody can toss me a magazine or two of, of green tip or, or whatever, and it's going to work out. Um, All right. We're going to take uh, two questions. Yep. Uh, Scott, what's the best first focal plane uh, adjustable scope? That's all dependent on the person. Uh, we're both two different brand loyalists, uh, and it's mainly just probably comes down to experience. Um, I'm a loophole guy. I love Night Force. I've had them in okay. the past. The attackers, I think, are phenomenal. I know you're a big Night Force guy. I, I, to be honest, I mean, I love both. Both yeah. brands make great. I have um, been using a couple of Night Forces for the past few years now. I've got this is the four to sixteen mm -hmm. uh, first focal plane, and I've got the one to eight. Yeah, okay. Attacker. We're on optics. Uh, magnification range, um, like on my, on my SPR, this is kind of my general purpose gun. Yeah. Would I use it for everything? You know, something that I have shot out to 600 with this because of the reticle and the ammo and everything, and I mm -hmm. like have the ability to. And what's do your it. magnification on that? This Eight? is a six power. Oh, okay. One to um, six. So like I use this for for everything. It's what right. lives in my truck. Um, one to six. Um, I for this setup, I don't really need much more. But I think kind of the sweet spot is that 16 to 18 power shorties. Yeah. I think uh, I would rather have more mm -hmm. and have the ability to dial it down, especially when it's, in, when it's a rifle that's intended for that longer distance. LPVOs like that, I got two 1 to 6s. I love them. I love my 1 to 6s. But I don't consider it a DM type of optic. It could be pressed into service for that. But I figure 8 is about what we need. <laughs> Man, you are getting roasted in the wow, comments dude. right now. All right, um, I'm gonna, I'm I'll gonna. Take add, <laughs> yeah, you can have Colin in a second. Yeah. Uh, Whitney, chrome alloy versus stainless steel. It depends on the manufacturer. Um, I find chrome alloy barrels, whether it be like 4140 or uh, 416R, like those barrels are really great combat barrels. They give you a lot of life. Uh, stainless steel cut rifle barrels are going to give you more accuracy, but you're going to suffer in life. Uh, it, for round yeah, numbers yeah, wise, round um, you know, like the, the barrel that's in my, my 24 inch down here, it's a stainless steel barrel. It's probably going to get 30 to 40% less barrel life than the hammer forge barrel in this. Probably more, I would say, probably 50% less. Yeah, and then than you're the also Amforge looking barrel. at what kind of coatings, mm -hmm. you know, are on the inside. If it's a nitrided uh, barrel, you can, there's, there's some really good not match grade barrels that yeah. you can get better than a minute of angle out of it. And, uh, you know, there's, you almost don't need to look at match grade for something like this, especially if this is going to be something you shoot a lot. Mm -hmm. You may want to go with a good quality. I mean, like I said, I mean, I, I brought up Roscoe earlier. They've got another line that is nitrided. Mm -hmm. And, Which we uh, have sold a lot of. And uh, I've got uh, some of those. Those are lights out barrels. Mm -hmm. And I would easily replace that barrel with one of those if, you know, that's what I had and, and shoot the heck out of it and get good accuracy. Um, I feel like you need to actually read out Colin's message and then So respond. Colin Keeney, I'm calling you out, man. So everybody, Colin says that I'm dressed like I'm a small town pastor about to go preach the gospel. So I guess I should say, do you have a moment to talk about our Lord and Savior? The night vision goggle. Yeah, that's a true yeah. statement. Is that well? I guess I am known for the night vision stuff. So yeah, um, and the reason why, like, Don has a lot of technical ability and a lot of things that fall. Oh man, even Will Petty's on this, dude. Dang. Uh, so what's up, girl? Uh, Don's knowledgeable on a lot of things. Uh, we talk everything from long gunner stuff to when I was in the night vision. Don and Sam, when they were a team, or Sam's still a team, you see, when you were, they, you guys were my, my benchmark, my reference for any questions that I had. Um, and because night vision has become more cost effective, the technology has gotten yeah. significantly better than when it was, you know, 5, 10, 15 years ago. It's, be, it's integrating into the you know, commercial side as well yeah. as law enforcement's picking it up more and more. It's, it's more available. It's, you know, it's more reasonably priced than it used to be. Um, 
this is a roast. This is Dang, the worst dude. live ever, ever. <laughs> I hate all these people. It's yeah. Uh, they're so what I get. Next time I won't tell anybody we're doing this every yeah. time. Yeah. Well, um, we love you all. Yeah. Okay. So thanks, Josh. Uh, um, tell me about this big thing on the on, on that the is the, the uh, that is the it's called a CNVD clip-on night vision device. It's the PBS 24 LR by L3. Um, basically, it's it's a night vision. What does device. this give you? For civilian end users, and then what does it give you from the law enforcement side? On the civilian side, uh, well, it, it gives the same same basic capability: the ability to use your magnified optic in the dark mm -hmm. with night vision without having to take it off and replace it with a scope. Um, historically, there used to be night vision scopes that were a plenty, um, and because the yeah, you'd army have a daylight and, and you have a yeah. low light or a no light scope to where you have right. to take off. And, but the, the military said, "Look, we don't we don't want that anymore. We want something else. We want some way that we can not have to switch optics, you know, in a, in a battlefield environment." So uh, what there there was the PBS ten, I think it was. It was a day night scope. It lasted for a little while. It was a great concept, but then they perfected the ability to clip a night vision device on in front of a magnified optic and that pretty much killed the uh, yep. the night vision scope market. It's starting to come back for hunters because there's still a big um, interest in it mm -hmm. in, in those guys will put one on a rifle and leave it on a rifle. That's like that's my nighttime hog hunting rifle. It's got a uh, you know, thermal scope or a night vision scope. But these things, I mean, they're not cheap. They're expensive. Yeah, and I only really have uh, experience with the PBS 30s. Yeah, uh, PBS just, 30s are awesome. Yeah. Um, I mean, I love them all. I'm, I'm equal on that. Um, but what these things do for you is they, they give you a green screen through your scope. So you're going to have a little bit of shift in your point of impact, but it's predictable and it's um, repeatable. repeatable. Yeah. So you, you just figure out what it is, adjust for it here when you put it on, and, and go. Okay. So that, that's really all you need to do. It's, it's really, it is pretty much that simple. It, it's like any night vision, what um, its limitations are, lighting. Mm -hmm. you, know, you can only shoot lighting and glass. You can put this thing in front of a cheap ass scope and you're not gonna get the results that you wish you were getting. Um, same thing as you can put it in front of a really, really good scope, but it can be so dark that you're just not getting yeah. the performance. That's why over here I've got, I've got them all. I've got them all DA. Um, here it's not because I'm gonna do CQB with them all. It's so that I can illuminate a target or punch through that darkness, those photonic barriers, to be able to see, to let this thing, give this thing the light that it needs to amplify so I can see my target. So it's, it's really awesome for law enforcement. It's, it definitely, um, it brings the, the law enforcement marksman or sniper or designated marksman into the nighttime um, the, like nothing else. And it gives them the ability for pr uh, proper target identification and everything like that. Um, no, Colin, you can't use a PVS-7 as a clip-on device. Thank you very much. So my, uh. my, my big things on SPR as, as a whole is um, they're a scalable system yeah. to attack anything. So ultimately, they would be a general pro purpose gun. Yeah, the we, ability, could, we could pull all this stuff off of here and have this right there. Yep. And it's light. It's easy. Say you're going hunting. Mm -hmm. this, is, this is, you know, my generation and, and our generation's um, Legos. rifle, yeah. you know, yeah. it, it's, it's, our, it's our rifle, you know, um, generations before us, you know, you look at the grand and, and different things, you know, like I say, you know, 308 is the modern day odd six. Yeah. When I was a kid, my dad's like, yeah, you get a hunting rifle, you should get it in 30 odd six. Cause if you run out of ammo, any corner gas station in the middle of nowhere, you can buy a box of ammo mm -hmm. today. That's 308. This is the modern day rifle. So many of us grew up with it. We served with it. We fought with it. And we take it hunting. I, I, I would hunt with this rifle in, in higher calibers if I was hunting big game. And you could strip this down, and this would be a great gun for that. Yeah, I mean, that, and that's uh -huh. another thing on the ammunition side. Like, that speaks to, to what a DMR SPR is, mm -hmm. is caliber commonality. For mm -hmm. me, SPRs are 5.56 guns. Yeah. They just mm -hmm. are. Um, your 308 guns, they're more, you know, they're more slippery yeah. type rifles where... Your 5.56, five, it's Redneck NATO. You can go to Walmart yeah. and buy decent 5.56 five, mm -hmm. ball blasting ammo. Uh, some Walmarts carry match ammo. So Yeah, weren't we saying how you were, you were hitting steel mm -hmm. out to, what, yeah. 600 with, yeah. with Wolf Gold? Yeah, just you know? basic ball. I mean, it all comes you're not going to shoot tight-ass groups with it, but 
you know. Uh, okay, so we've gotten kind of guns everywhere. Uh, notice both of them are, are bipods. Both of us also have are on the mindset of having a quick detach lever system on it. Mm -hmm. So that way, if we did need to dish it and use it and employ it in a different manner, we can scale it down I can really fast. Take it off, move it forward, move it backwards. If I have enough rail space, I could pop it off and put a longer bipod. I have mm -hmm. I have two that that's my short one, but I got two of the ones that are a little bit longer than that. So if you need that, um, or you don't want it at all, you just want to carry it and carry it in a pack in case you need it. Yeah, it's just it is scalable. I mean, with Picatinny and M-Lock stuff, we can we can put stuff on it, and take yeah. stuff off. Ammunition, that's that's the big thing yeah. for the soldier on the battlefield. The ability to um, interchange, get ammo from from his mates on his on his in his squad or something like that. Regardless, is, if you're going great. from ball to match right. ammo, right? The ability you to know, chamber you're carrying you're carrying match, and we were talking about practice. Mm -hmm. You know, you can spend a lot of money. You can spend over a buck around for for good, you know, match grade factory ammo, but you don't need to to practice, especially at closer ranges. Yeah. So, yeah, it's and and we love ARs. Yeah, I mean, the ability to take these out and, and shoot them and run them at classes yeah. and run them at matches. In the, in the DMR course, the we shoot standard distances out to 600 meters. Yeah, for the people that don't know, give us a little rundown on what, what they can expect. If they, if they signed up for the, the Rock Castle class, yeah. what's well, kind of a, a tasting of, of that class? Um, well, first of all, the, the gear that you'll need is, I mean, this, this rifle that Adam's got here would be perfect, except I would recommend a little bit more magnification on the nope, scope. Nope, I can do it. Well, he'll Give show me iron sights, Yeah, man. he'll come out and, and, <laughs> and, and, and you could do it. I, I have a, a friend of mine who's a faithful alumni who shot the course. The range we were at, I think the farthest we could actually get was 550, and he shot it with a, with a razor. One to six, but he was doing a lot of swagging and a lot of Kentucky windage. His reticle wouldn't even support some of the holds that we were doing. But because he's a, he's an amazing rifleman, mm -hmm. he was able to pull it off. I think um, eight power is. Um... Hey Todd, what's up? Scope requirements for best clip on use. Uh, didn't I talk about that? You just tuned in. Maybe not. Um... So let's keep let's <laughs> anyway, keep on let's keep on going. Class. But I'll get there, Todd. Um, for for the class. I, I tell everybody, 8x is the minimum you're going to want to have. I, you, you'd be better off with a 10 mm -hmm. minimum, like a 2 to 10 of some sort, with some sort of mill reticle. Okay. Um, I'm a big fan of the Horus reticles. I'm a big yeah. fan of the H59 and the Tremor 3, yep. stuff like that. But I'm not saying you got to go out and get that. But if you have something with one of those Christmas tree type yeah, ballistic, if you have a hold off reticle, type of it makes reticle. life significantly yeah. easier. Because that's what the course is is designed for. It's not we're not going to be twisting knobs. Once we get you zeroed, it's all about figuring out your holds for these different distances. So uh, a scope that will will support that is is what we're looking for. And then from that, you need a you, you need if if your gun will shoot at least a, a fat minute. Yeah, a fat minute. I'm gonna say if you can shoot at least a two inch group at 100 yards. You'll be okay. Yeah, if you shoot a one-inch group, you know, if your gun's capable of it, mm -hmm. then then good. I'm not saying you got to go out and rebel your rifle for the class, um, but if it, if it's capable of a two-inch group at 100 yards, you know, you'll you might leave there thinking, yeah, okay, I, this is I need a new barrel and I need a new trigger. A good trigger is a is a um, is a key thing. I've got you know yeah, I think guys, guys with triggers in both of ours. most of mine, but I like my CMC triggers as well. Mm -hmm. uh, something like that. Um, is is great. Oh, another interesting thing is uh, stocks, and both of us, neither one of us, have that. But um, as much as I love the Sot Mod style stock, it's not good for that. Oh yeah, when you shoot it, it closes. Well, with your rear bag right yep. right there, very likely that your bag is going to trip the lever. Yep. And as soon as yeah, as soon as recoil happens, so the ability to lock in a place, but even a Magpul CTR with the little locking mm -hmm. um, thing is gonna is gonna do that. Um, you don't have to have this, you know, big wide stock like that. And, and other than that, um, that's it. A level is nice to have, but you can get by without it. Yeah, I mean, you can level the turret to the left yeah, and I mean, get away with it. If, if I'm really, really trying to split hairs, I'm looking to see if my, my, level, my gun is level and all that stuff. Patrick Roberts, what's up, buddy? Hope you're doing good. We miss you. Mm -hmm. Have fun out in Texas. <laughs> so, uh, so, okay, what are your average target, or what's the target engagement window for an SPR or DMR type gun? What are you going to employ them at, minimum and maximum? In a, and specifically, yeah. at a 5.56 five, roll, what we have I mean, here, I say basically describe. zero to 600 okay. um, 
is is what you could because it's it's not a sniper system and a guy who's carrying this normally isn't a sniper he's yeah. normally a regular guy who's also charged with or has stepped up and said I'll I'll take on the responsibility of being able to do some precision stuff at farther distances so he's still going to have to probably I mean if it's if it's a law enforcement officer he's still going to have to grab that thing if that's the only one he has and use it to respond to an active shooter yep. in a in a school too so that's why I like my offset aim point cuz I can just roll it and do my thing illuminated reticle I'm not I, I'm not sold that uh, illuminated reticle Todd is is that big a deal? This has one, and I'm not even sure if I have a battery in it. Um, don't use it. If it's so dark that I need the illuminated reticle, I usually can't see my targets either. So, so and it the, definitely doesn't help me with this. So for all. people that want to know, uh, Todd asks, illuminated reticle required or not? Got a picture from the scope view. Uh, I would say no. Uh, illuminated reticles mainly come from the hunting world, where you're shooting at that like either dust on, like yeah. borderline of light, no light. Um, it's not going to serve you any any kind of goodness regardless. Uh, the problem I find with illuminated reticles is it makes your overall reticle thicker. It messes with your either your night vision or that transitioning vision from yeah. dark to light, light to dark. Uh, and it's just another thing that can go wrong. This has one. All my other have them. I've never put a battery in and I've never turned them on once and it's never caused me any headache. Yeah, I'm not pretty using. sure this one has an illuminated reticle. And like I said, I don't turn it on. I don't know if it has a battery in it. Now your your um, LPVOs, if mm -hmm. it's got illuminated red dot in it, that's a different story. Yeah, then you but like you dial this down to one and chuck it up and use it like an aim point yeah, or but an An illuminated full on reticle. I'm, I'm just, it's one of those good ideas that really. Yeah, like I said, yeah. it doesn't transition well out of the hunting realm. It's got its specific niche there, but it doesn't necessarily transition over to my world being the comp side or. Don's world, you know, the real world the operational side. side. Uh, so if you've got any more questions, feel free to hit us. We're going to talk about some more support gear stuff. Yeah. Um, one thing that I try to keep, uh, if I don't have a bipod by chance, is a mag pole with a... Uh, with a mag pod. With a mag pod on the yeah. bottom. This allows you to get the same kind of effect as using a bipod by simply balancing it on the magazine. Yeah, dude, I mean, I've been team mag pod mm -hmm. for, for years and years. Love it. Um, Got probably every generation of those on on various mags in my in my bags, and they're they're an, an awesome little piece of kit. Yep. And then uh, for me on a DM gun, SPR gun, uh, the standard magazine capacity is a 20 rounder. Yeah. Uh, 30s prevent me from getting low and prone, or 20s give me the ability. Yeah. 20, to run 20s are the be. sweet spot. Um, 30 round magazine. You'll have to. You'll find yourself extending your bipod legs mm -hmm. probably longer than you need them. Yep. Um, being able to get as low as possible is the name of the game, and then coming up from there is is uh, what I like. So yeah, 20s, 20 round mags. If you're gonna build yourself, the thing is you don't need a lot of them. No. If you've no. got three or four, that's plenty. Um, yeah, I mean, you're not burning through you're these. You're not burning it down with these things. Uh, and then, okay, here's a neat piece of kit that you brought that I, I usually carry with me at every match. Yeah. But why would anybody want to invest in a tripod? Why is that a thing? You know, what does that give you? It gives you the ability to get up off the ground mm -hmm. and still have stability when there isn't some sort of support okay. available to you in my book. You know, I'm, I'm a big proponent, if, if any of you guys are following me, I think just the other day I, I made a post on Instagram about support. And it's less about using cover, as, and it's more about making sure you're stable to get those shots. If, if you're in a, a, a life or death, so say it's a, you're a professional, an armed professional, and this is your job, you can't afford to miss, right? So you need to do everything you can do. You know, I don't call it cheating. You need to do what you have to do or anything you can do to stabilize yourself yeah. to make a shot. Sometimes there's not always gonna be something where you need it to be to, to do that. So having a, having a tripod is, is yeah. like you're carrying your own you know, barricade brace around with you. For, for like us on the comm side, yeah. the chance of us ever shooting on our belly is slim to none. I think I maybe mm -hmm. have done that two stages so far this year, uh, but everything else is either like a standing, a kneeling, or mm -hmm. a modified version of prone on an obstacle. Um, where we end up, deploying these is mainly as a, a rear rest more than a, like a front support. So basically okay. think, you know, yeah. use your back hand, put your butt stock on it and drive it yeah. up and down. And just pinch it there. Yep. Yeah. No, that works good. I mean, th these things are very versatile. 
Yeah, you can pick them up super cheap. Uh, mm -hmm. Old surplus uh, Marine Corps sniper ones come up mm -hmm. all the time. Um, if you're planning on putting a gun on it, make sure you get one that's weight rated. Mm -hmm. uh, so you can get ones that have kind of flimsy uh, ball head attachments that can't take the weight of an eight or nine pound rifle, let alone- Especially uh, with recoil. Yeah, a 20 pound Add gun. It. So what other kind of support gear would you need at this class that would make your life better and yeah. make your overall By the way, experience? if we're talking about my class, you don't need this. You could bring it if you have it, and I'll have a couple out there that we can, you know, you, we can familiarize with. But you need you need at least one good rear bag of some sort. Okay. All right, you've got a couple up here. Yep. Um, I'm, I'm a person that doesn't go without right. having at least one or two. Yeah, and I was just complaining that I need more because they they seem to grow legs um, mm -hmm. around around uh, everywhere I go. But a rear bag, you put this, you know, you're putting this behind you, and your your buttstock is going or in your shoulder, so your butt stock is going on top of this. So you're you're able to adjust it by squeezing it. I don't know if you guys can see, but as I squeeze this and manipulate it, I can move it up and down and make my um, butt stock nice and firm. Well, I can also just lay it on a piece of cover yep, and use or as a, as a barricade to keep me from having metal on wood or metal on metal. If it's a car, the hood of a car or something like that, it gives me that something something soft for it to grip into. Yep. And some of them are actually made, when it, I thought one of you had. That one. Had, this one has like some grippy stuff and some of them have, will have like some non-skid mm -hmm. type stuff. Real handy stuff and this is a bigger bigger bag. You can use it on a, on a piece of, you know, see this? Improvised rest, anything yeah. you need. Yeah, so they, they, they serve more um, than just being in, in the rear okay. in, in my book. I mean, heck, you could put it on the ground, put your knee on it if it's rocky and, and you're gonna be there for a while. <laughs> If you want. What's a uh, round count at, a, at an average class? Um, you need to bring 500 rounds. You may or may not shoot all of it. Okay. Um, the majority of it, I'd say at least 300 of it minimum needs to be match grade ammo. You could bring some ball ammo, or I'd say bring 500 match grade rounds and bring some, some decent ball ammo. So if we're doing some stuff where we're working in close and it's not a big deal, you don't have to shoot your buck around stuff. Okay. Uh, Jason. Best magnification range for up, an SPR zeroed at 600. Zero to 600? Um, we, uh, uh, yeah, I, I zero them at 100, and I'm pretty sure that's what you guys do too. Yeah, um, uh, for everything for us is, is 100 yard zero. Um, I don't, we all know that 50 is not 200. Yeah, yeah, the 50, a, the 50 or the, and the 200 yard or meter zero are good for the combat carbine. Yeah. For With these, this, it's most of these dial it up, zero to yeah. 100, that way you can dial it into your ballistic calculator or you can exactly. do long hand math, however you yeah, want to most, do it. I'm most of our so reticles and our magnified yep. optics and scopes are, are basically set to be zero to 100 so we can do the holdovers. Um, and then, you know, it just depends on your bullet, your barrel length, and all that stuff as to what your holds are going to be out to 600. And in terms of like magnification, uh, like setting, um, generally on like my four to 16 or four to 18 i kind of live in that 12 power just that way i get a good field of view yeah. but i still get some magnification on the target yeah um, if you crank it all the way up it's like everything's shaky mm -hmm. and moved if you back it off a little bit it doesn't seem as as uh, as jittery all right we got another question from, Todd, uh, from huh? me uh knight's armor and the lpr for an spr based in your experience it's an amazing rifle uh lpr stands for light precision rifle Come standard with a Krieger barrel. Uh, it's probably the most accurate gun that it's made. Geisley, it's an 18 inch um, gun, has their two stage SSAE, match trigger. Right? No, no. It's so a, it's nice, a nice, nice trigger. Yeah. So yeah, uh, for a turnkey gun, uh, I've actually had a couple people that want to buy 5.56 five, guns for PRS stuff. Like you can't get much better than that, that gun. Like for a turnkey, I don't have to build it. I can just swipe a mm -hmm. card you know, slap an optic on it and go shoot some stuff. Yeah. It, the, the LPR is really a hard one to beat. Uh, so we're, we're winding down here, so give us a couple more questions. We're going to go through probably one or two more yeah. things, and then we'll probably... Slings? When you're competing, you use a sling? No, sir. So That's not a thing for that's us. That's a little bit of a different thing. So in, in the tactical environment, I, I mean, a sling is also, I mean, that's your holster mm -hmm. for your rifle. So you want to have a sling. You're going to be carrying it around in real life. That way you need to have a sling. We may find ourselves climbing up ladders, climbing over walls, yep. doing whatever. You might have to sling that thing you know, for, for all kinds of different reasons. Um, but also you can use that sling to tighten up for yeah, shoot shooting, shooting positions, positions stuff. and stuff like that. So you can really use a lot. And, and I like the two-point adjustable. It's hard for me to get away from the VTAC sling. It's just 
yeah, the, general, the, the you know, generally the useful. The Blue Force Gear Vickers, yeah, like the, all those um, are really, really The Sea Attack one. Mm -hmm. Any of the ones that are easy to adjust quickly and have a good solid two-point hookup are, are going to help you. But yeah, I know the competition guys, slings just kind of get in the way for that. But when it's something you carry around all day long, yeah. slings a holster. Mm -hmm. um, you need that thing, but you can you can use it to your advantage. All right, Todd, what what's next? My favorite what? My favorite. I'm assuming he's asking sling? SPR. My maybe? favorite sling. No, my favorite rifle. Favorite oh. SPR. That's the okay. question. It's English. Dude, I don't it's a know. Thing. The, uh, I mean, this is my favorite. I mean, this is my baby. I built it. Um, but uh, no, I like uh, the the night stuff. Uh, you know, a lot of you guys know I have a relationship or have had relationships with ADM. They make really good rifles, yep. and they have, uh, you know, good ambi controls, and they use high-quality barrels. Um, but it, any of the prominent builders out there, I yeah, mean, BCM ever, makes really good stuff. The key thing to look at is you want to look at what, you know, what kind of, you know, the big two big things in this are the barrel and the trigger. Yeah. Are, are going to be your two deciding factors for, for a lot of it. Everything else is just what do you like. Yeah. Do, do you like key mod? Do you like... Um, all right, uh, we'll, we'll focus on that and then we'll answer okay. this next one. Um, um, okay, so we got slings. So, what about like uh, weather meters and ballistic apps? I mean, is that something that you employ or do you guys, do you make guys in the class learn it the old fashioned way of like shooting at distance and then we, writing it down? We kind of do it the old fashioned way. For one, my class is only two days. Mm -hmm. So there's only so, so much ground you can cover in, in two days. If guys have their own, um, you know, ballistic, ballistic arc or wind meters or kestrels, bring it because it's value added yep. and the other guys get a chance to see what it is and and, and all that um, the ballistic apps are great though if but the key thing is you have to know your velocity so yep. we have to either bust out the magneto speed or something like that to to get velocities or you need to have done that before you show up and then we can and and what those do is they get you they get you pretty close yeah you still, you know, got to shoot it to really know exactly what it's, in my book anyways, exactly what that bullet's going to do out of your gun at this distance under these conditions. So that's what we do, and it's a good learning experience. So the guys have a good idea, and I have, I already have a good idea of what, what they should be holding based on, you know, just having done this enough times. Yeah. And I can look at their guns like, okay, you have a little bit shorter barrel. What ammo are you shooting? Okay, that's going to be a little bit slower than this one. Um, just a few things like that, but taking notes. Mm -hmm. and, and usually the first day you're taking notes, you're figuring it all out, and then the, the second day it's like ting, 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 guys are, guys are ringing steel all the way out to six pretty, pretty easily. Uh, what about tools? Like, like I kind of always carry my fix-it mm -hmm. stick set. Um, anything that you keep within arm's reach or you'd recommend to bring to these classes? Again, and this yeah. is the reason why I keep asking about the classes because more people are getting into training, uh, they're especially the specialized, more unique stuff. Um, and it's just these things are tips and tricks to help you guys get the most out of it, to have a better time. Yeah. So that way you can take the knowledge that you're getting and go back and have a good time. Uh, so, yeah, I'd say uh, something about this size or what, what I have is that I didn't bring in. It's just like a little general purpose pouch, the zippered pouch um, that has a, a, a small set of Allen wrenches. Um, a couple little levels in it just in case we got to re-level somebody's scope. If you have any specific tools you need to adjust your, your scopes or your optics, make sure you bring them. Okay. Um, you know, just things like that. If there's something that you have that, that you know is proprietary and you're not going to be able to make adjustments on your scope without it, um, you don't have to bring a whole set of Allen wrenches, but, you know, whatever it is that you need to tighten a loose um, mount, yep. say, um, if you've got some Loctite or some Vibratite, which is what I like to use, um, but you know, I bring I bring a lot of that stuff. Yeah. I've got a big old tool bag full of stuff that I always bring um, with stuff because you know stuff happens. Yeah, it yeah. does. Uh, Sam Bass, what stock are you guys running on your guns? I just swapped out the LMT on my SR25 for a Magpul STR SL. I forgot which because when the rear bag. Uh, when, mm -hmm. when, sorry, because when rear bagging it, I was scared of pressing. Yeah, yeah, that's so, what we were talking about earlier. It's exactly that. It's it's a great stock, except for this purpose. Yeah. So what happens? Uh, this is, is the Magpul. What's the? That's the, that's an STR. S STR. So, I've got like three of these. Yeah. Love they, them. It's a great stock. Uh, and that's B5. Just an SL. Yeah. B5 is supposed to be coming out with his mm -hmm. um, soon. If it's not out already, I don't know. I'm looking forward to um, checking it out. Yeah, so right. SOP mods, normal M4 collapsible stocks that have the, the trigger wedge here. What happens is people have a tendency to run their rear bags 
not quite as far forward as they need to. And when they fire, this will hit the latch, collapsing the stock and causing a really nice gash in people's eyes. Or just a pain in the butt. You know? Yeah. It's like my stock keeps coming loose. Uh, ammo for SPR God. that's proven. Uh, I know there's some in recent ballistics that were questionable on the Atlanta arms, yet I have some. Yeah. I'm confused by your English. Yeah. Sir. Well, so here's the thing. In, in, in my alumni group, I have a, a, an alumni who's had a, f a few issues with um, standard deviation on some of the Atlanta mm -hmm. arms. I'm thinking that that's a, a batch issue because I've never, I've had some amazing results with Atlanta arms, uh, 77 grain TMK. I've also had great results with the Black Hills, both SMK and TMK, 77 grain. Um, I get students, uh, to be honest with you, I get guys who come to class. I got a couple of dudes that have been shooting. Um, the, the IMI, yeah. 77 grain. That's fantastic. And they're rocking it. Now, I will say it's a little slower. Mm -hmm. Their holds are a little bit more than, than everybody else, especially once we get out there. But it's reliable, and it's rocking it, and they're saving some money on that stuff, so it's good ammo. I even had a dude um, with success with a Privy Partisan 77 mm -hmm. grain stuff. So you can, you know, I mean, I, I, I tend to be a little bit of an ammo snob from yeah. time to time, but, but guys have shot some pretty, you know, stuff that we might turn our nose up with good results. Yeah, so with standard v deviation, especially in factory ammo, anything really under 10 is acceptable to me and is actually pretty incredible. Yeah. Really anything 10 to 15 f feet in standard deviation is really incredible compared to what it used to be. Um, ammo manufacturers like Hornady, uh, the Magtech 77 grain, the IMI, uh, Federal uh, Gold Medal gold Match has match. been the gold standard for a long time. Um, they're all great out of the box. Um, they'll get you close and speed wise, but remember to check the speed in each gun because every gun will shoot that bullet differently. Even if I took one round out of that box, put it in my gun, then put one in Don's gun, they're gonna shoot differently. Yeah. Um, loading ammo, you can get better, but that's going into a whole nother world that most people aren't willing to travel into. Yeah, I mean, if you're a hand loader, you're not asking these questions. Yeah. You, you've, you've nerded out about it to the point where yeah, you know what we're problem. talking about. It's a real problem. It can you know be. It's a problem. It can be. Uh, if you can hit on illuminators for use with a PBS okay. 30. There you go. Right, That's all you we go. got. Well, we were talking about this in the beginning, and we never kind of went back to it. Sam, got them all right here in conjunction with the uh, CNV DLR. Um, 30 would be a great option, too. Um, here's how we like to use them all. The mall is an illuminator mm -hmm. for this. We're not using this to, uh, to shoot to actually aim with. Yeah. But having said that, we'll co-align it with the center of the reticle at like as much of an infinity distance as we can. That way the laser beam and the illuminator are looking right at the center of your, or are shining for you right into the center of your reticle. Yeah. So what you're getting from that is not, don't use it to shoot, still use your reticle and your holds to shoot, but you're getting that illumination into that dark window and through that dark photonic area that, that you might not be able to see through with this, or mm -hmm. it's just extending the range a little bit. Because like I said earlier, good glass is important yep. to be behind this, but you also still have all the same limitations that any other night vision device would have, which is And you also can't lighting. drive magnification up on these because you're not magnifying right. like you are with this. You're actually just magnifying yeah. the screen that you're so looking at. So various clip-on devices are rated for different mm -hmm. magnification levels, depending upon how much you spend, you're going to get more, generally speaking, the, the ones that will rate the higher magnification, like the PBS 30. Mm -hmm. What was that? That's good for like up to like 15 Yeah, you can run it up to the 15, rated, 16 power. You know, which, which to be honest with you, whatever the manufacturer says is like the, the range, I would pick the center and say that's going to be your sweet spot. Mm -hmm. The high end is, it's not, it's marketing, but it's also under perfect conditions. Yes. So that means I've got a really good scope and I've got really good lighting conditions, not just where I am, but where the target is. Mm -hmm. So those are the things to look at. And that's why the magnifier or the uh, illuminator really, really helps us with that. It gives us the light that we may not have naturally, but you're right. We may not, even though I have 16 X during the day, I may only be able to crank it up to 12 yeah. to really get a good image because I'm just magnifying this image that's being seen right here. This thing is still one X power. Yep. Um, well, Don, I appreciate it, man. Are we I done did, already? Yeah, no, we have cruised through. Uh, we're about 45 minutes, so right. yeah, we, we moved it. Uh, I know you got some classes coming up. Tell the people where you're going to be at, what you got um, going on, and also how to get in contact Yeah, off the top you. of my head, I don't remember all the dates, but in mid-September, I'll be in Rockcastle, Kentucky, doing uh, the, actually this stuff right here. 
looking uh, at getting on the books for Central Florida down at Aries probably in February. I got to go talk to Trey, the owner down there. That'll be good. Um, real soon. That's one of my one of my favorite places to go, and he's been doing a lot of good work there. Uh, Night Fighter. This is Night Fighter season. We're rolling into as soon as uh, it starts to be daylight savings and getting dark earlier and earlier. Um, First one's going to be actually kicking things off down in Homestead at the uh, the weekend before Thanksgiving, and then the f beginning of December in Georgia, then back in Florida. Anthony Wells, what's up, man? Um, Finish that, and then we'll hit okay. him last. Then we'll um, close yeah. this bad um, out. Yeah, uh, what else I got? Some red dot pistol stuff going on. Okay. Uh, I have an uh, association with Aztec Training Services, so they're bringing me out to Los Angeles. Oh, I love me some Chanley. Yeah, yeah, oh, I love, love those guys. Um, and then Virginia Beach, the yep. end of August for a couple of one-day classes. At, uh, it's an indoor range, too, by the way. So August in Virginia Beach and the indoor range is the place to be, uh, August 31st and September 1st. Okay. Um, shoot, I got a lot of stuff on the schedule. So GreenLineTactical.com is the website. Facebook, Don Edwards of GreenLine Tactical, and Instagram. You know, that's that's, that's, where, we, that's where we get the word out. Yep. Uh, if there's any questions you got, we're going to answer one last one here. Yeah, in a minute. okay. So my man uh, Anthony. But if you got any questions, leave them up here. We're gonna we're gonna watch this for a few more days, and we'll answer anything you got. Obviously, the night vision stuff. I'm going to lean on Don. He'll get that out to you. Sure. Uh, and then anything else will fall into it. Uh, Anthony so, Wells has a question about the great night force, <laughs> two and a half to 10 by 24, which they actually still make from time to time. We get them here yeah. uh, because we're a large dealer. Uh, we're a big night force dealer. Um, two and a half to 10 by 24, I think, is an awesome scope. Yeah. It's about the same size as this uh, loophole but it gives you that ability to run up to a 10X. The only thing that you're gonna find because your objective lens is so small is that light transmission's a little bit on the lower side and the edge-to-edge -edge, uh, clarity, uh, the eye relief is a little bit short for my liking on a 10X scope. Yeah, I mean, but you know, for, for a down on the prone kind oh, of gun where was, you're not as worried about it, that that's less of a thing. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're trying to shoot it LPVO style kind of thing, different. Different story. Um, the big thing there, I think, especially with some of these older um, optics, is the reticle. Yeah. Um, I, I'm not, you know, not that MOA style reticles are bad, but it's just like we're really starting to use mills a lot more and more and more. And uh, when it comes to holds and stuff like that, mills just seems to be um, so much easier for guys to grasp and to use. Um, could could somebody get away with using that at an SPR course, though? They I think it, they I have, think but have to be honest to? with you, it's really kind of a pain. Okay. Um, I mean, if if they if they can not do it, I'd prefer it, and they'll have a better experience. Okay. At the class, let's put it that way. I'm not saying they're banned from it, but uh, we're always kind of wild ass guessing it when we when we do some of those um, holds. Um, now, the more guys in the class that have it, the easier it is because one guy figured it out and was like, "Hey, Joe, what'd you hold for that last target? Yep. Okay, try this." You know, start stealing wind thing. calls from other yeah. people on elevation calls. Yeah, um, and, and we're sitting out there. And, and we really do rely on the ballistic computers a lot more when it comes to that, that kind of thing because it's just not something that, you know, you're holding, you're going from holding maybe four and a half mils to 15 MOA. Yeah. And your reticle may not even have that. So, yeah, there, there are just additional challenges to using that. And what most guys take away from it is, I'm getting a scope of the different reticle. Yeah. The neat thing about those old 2.5 to 10 by 24s is they were one of the original Mark 12 scopes. Mm -hmm. So them, there was like an 8-power loophole and like a couple other options. Yeah. But those were really what you saw on them. So uh, we appreciate it. If you guys need anything, you have any questions, feel free to either check out Don at Green Line Tactical or give me a call or shoot us an email here. And thanks again. We appreciate it. If you're not a member, make sure you get on Big Daddy Unlimited and sign up. First month's 99 cents. Then after that, man, it's good deals on ammo if you're coming to a DMR class, right? Absolutely. We can get you anything you need. So <laughs> Yeah, all the all, all your toys that you need, all your accessories that you need for this kind of stuff, I'm pretty sure you can get it all here. Yep, right? Yeah. Yeah. If there's anything you need, let us know. And thank you guys again. See ya. Later.